Hey there, it's Jason from Codemanship. In today's rookie mistake video, I want to cover a topic that is a little contentious. I see a lot of people debating it on social media quite heatedly sometimes. And that subject is mocks, mock objects. Uh, now, it's a bit of a misnomer. A lot of people, when they say mock object, they're referring more generally to what I call test doubles, of which mock objects are, are one kind, but you've also got stubs, you've got dummies, you've got spies, you've got fakes. Um, but most people generally refer to them as mock objects. So I'm going to go with the flow for this particular video and be less pedantic about it, and I'm going to call them mock objects as well. I want to illustrate the problem that many teams experience with mock objects, with this shopping basket uh, test class here. Now, as you can see, there's a whole bunch of mock objects involved here, a uh, mock product, a mock warehouse, mock orders, a uh, mock payment method, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and these are all mocks of dependencies of the basket class. And you can see, uh, as I scroll down through my test code here, um, that these uh, mocks are being set up over and over again. So every time we want to uh, test the basket, for example, these are all tests for checking out uh, our shopping basket, um, we get repeated references to these, these mock dependencies. Now, if we were to look at a sequence diagram of our shopping basket and how it interacts with its dependencies, we can see what the real problem here. The real problem isn't mock objects. They're a symptom of the real problem. The real problem is that basket knows too much about the internal design of the system. It's binding to too many of the other interfaces, which is a strong indication that Basket is doing too many things. So that's the problem we should really try to fix. The problem is that the, the responsibilities in this design are not evenly distributed. Basket has all of these direct dependencies and every test we want to write for Basket, we're going to have to include those dependencies. Um, so the mocks here are a symptom of the problem. What we really need to do is to refactor the design so that each of the classes involved in checking out your shopping basket um, does part of the work and has one or two of its own dependencies that basket doesn't need to know about. Then you end up with test code where in your test you might have one or two dependencies, one or two mock objects, but not five or six or seven, or I've seen tests where there are 20 or 30. So that's the first thing I want to note is very often when people complain about mock objects, what they're really complaining about um, is a problem with the design of the code that they're actually testing. Now, having said all of this, when we use mock objects in the way that we're using them here over and over again, um, this has the effect of baking in the internal design. We're exposing details of those internal dependencies in our test code, and then we're repeating that over and over again. So if we wanted to change that internal design, if we wanted to refactor our internal design of basket, um, we would have a problem. We would have to rewrite a lot of test code. So that is the problem that many teams experience, and I've seen it many times. But the true cause of the problem is not mock objects per se. The true cause of the problem is the design of the code that's being tested, and that's the thing you need to address. The other thing here is, does all of this need to be mocked? Um, for example, product is just a data class. It's just getters. Do we really need to mock that? Do all of these classes need to be mock objects? So that's the second mistake I see rookie developers make, which is that thinking when they're writing a unit test in inverted commas, that they should only be testing that particular unit. Um, this relates back to a previous rookie mistake video about developers trying to write tests for every unit of code, every method, every getter, every setter, every constructor. And, and this also has the effect of revealing much of the internal design to your test code, um, which also makes it much harder to change that internal design. So if you add these two anti-patterns together, you know, um, classes that are doing way too many things but have too many dependencies, and then you add into the mix um, a strategy of trying to test every method and every constructor and every getter and every setter, and to mock any dependencies of that unit of code that you're testing, 
then yes, you're going to end up with number one, lots and lots of tests. And in those tests, lots and lots of mocks. And that means that you've essentially baked in your internal design. It will be very difficult and expensive to change it. So that's the pain that many developers feel. The solution is to, number one, change the design so that the, the uh, responsibilities and the dependencies, the knowledge, if you like, are more evenly distributed so that in your call stack, each level, each layer in your call stack only knows about one or two other dependencies. Um, so you're not repeating all of those dependencies over and over again in every test. Um, you just have one or two, potentially one or two mocks in each test. Um, it's also very helpful if your tests are testing units of behavior, like what happens when you check out a shopping basket, rather than focusing on units of code. So test at a higher level, focus on end user outcomes, not methods and getters and setters and constructors and classes and modules and functions. And the third thing that goes wrong um, is just going mad with the abstractions, basically. This is one of the big complaints um, about mock objects is many mocking frameworks require you introduce abs abstractions like interfaces, for example. And so if you're over mocking, if you're mocking everything, you could end up with interfaces for everything. Um, not only does this really clutch up your code, it comes at a cost in terms of, for example, performance, if you're trying to write high performance code. Um, so it makes our code much complicated and it makes it slower and it makes it harder to refactor all going wrong at, well, at once. So you need, first of all, to get the high level design right. You need to figure out which part of the design is doing what, who needs to know about who, and you need to evenly distribute those responsibilities. Um, you also need to structure your code in such a way that um, some of the things in your tests you will need to mock, um, but most of them you won't. They'll be the real thing. They'll be real classes or real functions. Not everything needs to be a mock. Um, and the way to achieve this is to structure your code in such a way that within your code you have clusters of implementations, clusters of classes or clusters of functions that cohesively work together to perform some job, um, to take some responsibility, if you like, like managing the basket or managing payments or managing shipping. Um, and these are all concrete. Uh, these are not abstractions. And then in front of those, have a simple abstraction, like a, a simple Java interface, for example, that hides all of those details from any of the other clusters of classes that depend on them. So in reality, at a high level, what you have is clusters of classes or clusters of functions cohesively working together, but loosely coupled to other clusters, um, only interacting with simple interfaces, simple public interfaces, no knowledge of the internal de details, so that all of those details are hidden. And then you end up with a, a design that is, you know, very modular and very easy to change and uh, all of that good stuff. But you also tend up with tend to end up with test code that doesn't know very much about the internal design. So you would have tests for each cluster. You'd be testing through that public interface. You may be mocking any clusters that it depends on, that cluster depends on, and mocking their public interfaces, but revealing none of the details. Most of the design is hidden.